Good evening and welcome to the Danish Institute at Athens. The sound is fine? Yeah, super. It's a special pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, Lektor Emeritus Gorm Thorsen, teacher of Greek, Latin and Classical Studies at Helsingør Gymnasium from 1973 until 2011, and external lecturer in Classical Philology at the University of Copenhagen from 1992 until 2017. I think it's no exaggeration that Gorm Thorsen has played a significant role in the teaching and dissemination of the classical languages in Denmark, both at pre-university and university level, partly because of his writing of new Latin and ancient Greek grammars in Danish, as well as his production of translations of ancient texts for different levels of learning. In the summer of 2019, Gorm Thorsen taught for the first time a two-week intensive course in ancient Greek to provide basic reading skills to university students outside of the traditional classical studies at the Danish Institute of Athens. The first of many, we hope. Gorm Thorsen is also involved at a more strategic level, as well, uh, sorry, no, as chairman of the Society of Danish Language and Literature and of the Danish Society for the Translation of Historical Sources. In addition, Gorm Thorsen is the main editor of the recent series of new translations of the collected works of Plato into Danish. And he is the Danish member of the Presidium of the Nordic Plato Society. Apart from the Kian Lovell, which we will hear more about tonight, his current research projects include the botanical works of Theophrastus, as well as Danish texts in Latin by the Danish astronomer Ole Roma and the Danish king Christian den Fier. Please join me in a warm welcome. Thank you, and thank you for coming. I have to give a warning first, because uh, what I'm going to tell you is not a clear-cut result. Uh, it is a, a sort of work in progress. I've been working with this uh, subject for some years, but uh, it grows every day, and I'm not quite sure where I will end. Uh, the idea is that I will make a Danish translation of uh, uh, the letters uh, of Hion, um, a Danish translation with a commentary and uh, some studies in the theme of Tirani side. And um, uh, uh, it is the work of this, uh, this kind that I'm going to explain to you. This is a statue made by the Danish uh, sculptor Rudolf Steiner. It is made about uh, uh, 1930, and as you can see, it, uh, it uh, shows Hercules and the Hydra. But what does it actually tell us? Is it just Greek mythology? No, because uh, Tyler, who was very productive, had made several uh, sculptures of Greek mythology, but uh, always in a way of symbolism. So there must be some more truth hidden by this uh, statue that uh, actually is placed uh, in the harbor of Elsinore, Denmark. I will return to what it might mean a little later. First of all, it is a misunderstanding that the novel was created as a kind of literature in the 17th century. 
it was refound in a way because there are lots of more than 30 texts from Greek and Roman antiquity uh, that are what we would call a novel. A description of a personal life, uh, not mythological, but ordinary people or kings or things like that. Uh, and you can uh, put them in three uh, categories. The sentimental, the love story, uh, Cariton, Longos, Heliodorus uh, are good examples of that. There are satirical or picaresque uh, novels, uh, the most famous perhaps being uh, Lucian's uh, Onos, the donkey, uh, which is uh, also uh, exists in a Latin version by Apuleius. And then there are historical novels, uh, the, the most famous Callistinus's life of Alexander. Uh, these novels have special patterns of telling, and they uh, they uh, follow patterns that you can see from one novel to another. But there is another kind. And first of all, I have to say just a word about letters in antiquity. We have found lots of real letters, meaning letters actually uh, coming from private correspondence. The papyri in Egypt are very good examples of that. Then there are the literary compositions. Isocrates, Cicero, Seneca, and St. Paul as well. These letters are meant to be read not only by one person, but by a group of persons. They are in between uh, the, private, uh, the, uh, the private and uh, what we call it the public way of publication. And then there is a special group, letters pretending to be written by famous historical persons. That may be Amasis, the last king of Egypt, Themistocles, the hero uh, from Salamis, Phalaris, the very, very cruel tyrant uh, from Sicily, Hippocrates, Plato, and here I am in a very, very difficult field because to some people all the letters that we call, the 13 letters that we call the letters of Plato are actually not written by him. Some people think that. Others will say it's only the seventh the autobiography that is a real letter, all the others are made by others. It's not uh, uh, any consequence to me but uh, in this situation, but it's important to know that Plato's letters are actually in a group that are, um, that are a bit suspicious, I should think. Then the last group is a sort called a novels exclusively consisting of fictional letters. In German it's called Briefroman. And uh, the only existing example of that is the, the text that I'm going to present to you now. Uh, I just I put here uh, some books. This one is what we call what is called the Epistolography Gretti, meaning all the texts of letters and the, that's a kind of the letters pretending to be written. There are so many, 1,600, and nobody reads them anymore, and it's a pity. Um, this, uh, this book, I found it at the Nordic Library, and actually it belongs to the editor of the Kian, uh, the Kian novel, Ingemar Düring, uh, who has donated it to the library many, many years ago. This is a medieval manuscript. You can see uh, it is uh, written in Greek. You can see it, it is in the uh, Vatican Library. And uh, you cannot read what it is. Uh, what is it? I suppose you can't. It is difficult, but I can tell you that this manuscript has 
um, a, a sort of a title saying that the dear property of Constantinas Lascaros, written by himself in Milano in 1462. And um, in, in, uh, on page uh, 33 to 53, we hear that this is the letters of Hian, the Pontic Platonic philosopher. It is not a very important uh, manuscript, this one. There are better and older ones, but I think that this gives a very good idea of what happened to these letters. They were copied and copied and copied from uh, imperial times until uh, here where uh, uh, from, uh, from, uh, a from from Constantinople has uh, found a new home in, in Italy, in Milano, and has made a copy for himself. They have existed all the time, and some of them have been read rather often, and uh, they were translated into Latin and then forgotten. Especially because uh, it, was, it became more and more clear that these letters were not real letters, meaning that they were written by the persons that they pretended to be written by. But someone has written it, and therefore it is important to understand how and why and when. Um, my collection of the Hian letters um, uh, consists of 17 letters. They are pretended to be written by the young Hian um, in the years uh, in the middle of the 4th century. Actually, they are written in the 1st century AD. And how can I know? The reason is that the Greek, the Greek language changed and is still changing and uh, there are lots of phrasings in the texts that didn't uh, exist in the fourth century BC but did in the, uh, the early imperial times. That means that the, the, the author has tried to get a, a theme from from uh, the good old days, the classical period, that he has made into a sort of a novel. There are 17, and uh, you can see here that uh, we have uh, some from Byzantium, sent from Byzantium to his father, some from Kiev, some from the academy, and it is more easy to see here if we can look at the, uh, at the map here. Um, this person, Kion comes from the uh, city of uh, Herak Heraklea, Heraklea uh, in the Black Sea. It is uh, almost on, uh, on the outer, uh, uh, upper uh, right corner. Here, uh, the, the, this person is born and he lived here uh, until he decided, with help from his father, to go to Athens in order to study in Plato's Academy. And the first letters, I will show you some uh, examples uh, in a moment, uh, tell about his travel going from uh, Heraclea to Byzantium, from Byzantium to the nearby Cylindria, uh, to the, the nearby, yes, then they come to Chios and then they come to Athens. The, the text is, uh, is, um, is here. Uh, the text uh, uh, is divided into these main sections, and that means that you have um, a center. The center letters are uh, number five to number 13, written in, uh, in, in Athens, and telling about the life in Athens, and especially the life in the academy. Um, the interesting thing is that this person, Kian, actually existed. 
and he actually did what uh, he is, pro he is uh, proposing to do in the letters, namely killing the tyrant of Heraclea. Um, we have lots of, uh, of um, sources I can show you here. Uh, the oldest source is Socrates' seventh letter to uh, Timotheos. Timotheos is the next uh, tyrant in uh, Heraclea, the son of uh, Cleacos, and um, uh, Socrates uh, tells, uh, uh, corresponds with him uh, about how to manage a tyranny. There are um, um, an author from Heraclea called Nymphis who made a history. His, his own history isn't uh, extant anymore, but uh, it was used by Memnon who lived in the first century uh, AD. Then there are uh, the index of the academics that was found in uh, Herculaneum. Theodorus of Sicily, Sicily and the Roman author Trogus uh, in the, 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 the abridged edition by Justinus. That means that we know quite well what happened in Heraclea at that time. About approximately 370 Cleacus was a student in Plato's Academy and in Isocrates' school as well. In uh, 364, uh, uh, Cleacus made a coup, coup d'etat and became tyrant. In 353, uh, Cian kills Cleacus and has, is killed himself. And then uh, the Cleacus family continues ruling for the next century. So, in a way, this is a story that has, is based on actual historical facts. So, the author has taken a historical fact and made a novel out of it. Um, there is this interesting Index Philosophorum Academicorum, which was found uh, uh, in Herculaneum in the Villa dei Papiri, the Papyrus Villa, uh, where um, the, um, the, um, the Greek um, philosopher and author Philodemos uh, has written a list of members of the Academy. And on this list, in column 6, you can see Dion from Syracuse, who stopped Dionysus's tyranny. Chion from Heraclea, who killed the tyrant. Pithon and Heraclitus from Enos, who killed Cotus and received citizenship in Athens. That means that uh, people killing tyrants were not so uh, uncommon in the academy. It's interesting. I didn't know that, but, but um, you know, Plato uh, was, uh, um, for a long time, for several years, he was uh, at the court of the tyrants in uh, Syracuse and made uh, friendship with, with the Dian and uh, he was part of this uh, Syracusian um, tyranny and his efforts to reform it uh, collapsed as you may know. But he is only one of three persons at the same time. Then we should have a look at the letters. And the interesting thing is that if we didn't know that this person was a historical person, and he was called Kion, and he was from the aristocracy, and he was going to uh, kill the tyrant, we would be rather um, confused uh, when we start reading it, because the, uh, the author uh, goes, like, like Horace says, in medias res. He starts mid, in the middle of, 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 the, of the text without explaining anything. The letter one begins, Kia to Matris. 
who is Kia, who is Nastros. On the third day of my sojourn here near Byzantium, Lysis arrived with your letter telling me how worried you and the whole family are. You can see there is an I, there is a you, there is a Lysis. And as uh, things evolve, uh, it turns uh, up that, uh, that Kian is the writer. He is a young man, about 20 years, years old. His uh, mattress is his father. He also has a mother who is very, very worried as well. But um, we don't uh, hear uh, anything about the family unless it is dropped into the text little by little. You could call it unveiling technique. And um, this, uh, this um, text uh, is, um, is composed of letters revealing little by little the whole story. He, in um, uh, Byzantium, he meets Xenophon. Now people will say, you will say, uh, it's impossible because uh, Xenophon was in Byzantium in, uh, at, at the same time when Socrates died in uh, 399, and uh, this was in 358. So there are four, uh, forty years that are not uh, that are not uh, um, actually there is a sort of an anachronism. I should think it is, but nevertheless, this xenophon um, is he has arrived with his um, soldiers from the Anabasis, and uh, the soldiers are. Um, uh, very, very uh, undisciplined, and they start uh, robbing and stealing, uh, raping, and so on in Byzantium. And Xenophon stops it. He stops it with a speech where he tells them how to behave like ordinary uh, Greek soldiers, and uh, they uh, they do what they are told. And this young man is very, very impressed. And he in introduces himself, I introduced myself to him, and he remembered your friendship with Socrates, your mean, meaning the father. That means that his father has been in Athens studying or listening to Socrates. And he encouraged me to study philosophy and did not talk like a soldier, but like an educated philosopher. So, the first hero uh, in our story is Xenophon. Xenophon, who was a student of Plato, who was uh, this very, very courageous person uh, who wrote uh, about his uh, travels in the Anabasis and uh, the Greek history and things like that. So, uh, this very young man is very impressed and he is getting even more impressed um, uh, in the next letter. He has arrived in Athens and he gives his first impressions of Plato and his teaching. And he is talking about a philosophy which is not a political, a politeotos, but it is combining to practicum to bio or Ezekiel Akrabon, what we would call practical life with quiet contemplation, vita activa, vita contemplativa. That's what the impression that the young man gets when he is in the academy. And here all the uh, historians of the philosophy and the philologists and things like that start saying, but that's not how uh, Plato uh, taught in the academy. They seem to know. The fact is we don't know what happened in the academy. We have, first of all, the dialogues, but the teaching uh, of the teaching we know next to nothing. But nevertheless, people are 
uh, are rather uh, confused by this, uh, this explanation that Plato is teaching Vita Activa and Vita Contemplativa. We are not quite sure whether a young student understands all what the, his teacher says. And that means that the Plato in Kian's uh, objective uh, might not be the same as the, play, the real Plato. And that means that we all already here have a, an impression that there is a schisma between the author, author of the letter, the anonymous author of the letter, and the actor, that means uh, Kian. Author, actor, conflict uh, is rather, it, it becomes more and more clear that, uh, that there are problems uh, for, for the author to explain how this young man develops into a philosopher. It begins a very naive way, but uh, and he still is very naive uh, all, all the, the text through. But um, here uh, in number six, letter number six, he has received gifts from home, from uh, Heraclea. Pickled fish, five jars of honey, 20 jars of wine flavored with myrtle, myrtle and three silver talents. I do not want all, uh, money uh, at all since I have now arrived in Athens and attend Plato's school, he tells his father. Um, and uh, you can hear this naive person. Uh, by, uh, by the way, he has uh, two or three slaves with him and some attendants and so on, but they don't count. Please do send me such things that remind me of my, my country, not of wealth. And uh, three silver talents is a huge amount of money. Um, we remember that because they turn up a little later. He has also problems when he is here. He has a friend, Bion, home back home in Heraclea, and um, he feels lonely, and he writes a letter uh, with these words. I would not have expected you to care so little about me, and I'm not willing to interpret it in, in that way. Or have you forgotten? Callisthenes' lectures and all the other friends to whom we were so close attached that we used to speak of one soul and several bodies. It's a very lonely young man you can hear. Perhaps you think that I am unmindful because I have embarked upon philosophic studies. He is a young man far away from home and wanting to go home, but he can't because he is um, a student in Plato's Academy and you have to stay uh, to, to uh, fulfill your studies. The three talents of silver turn up again. Uh, in the letter 13 of Plato, of Plato, whenever it is written by Plato or not, uh, this person, Plato, complains about problems with dowries for Spocephus' wedding. The tyrant Dionysus from uh, Syracuse has sent thir uh, 30 minas, and Kion proudly tells his father. Seizing the welcome opportunity, I added a talent. That means that this young person has helped Plato uh, paying the dowry for Spocephus' wedding. The story tells. And that means several things. One of them, of them is that our unknown author knows the letters of Plato. And he makes the story uh, a pendant, a sort of appendix to, uh, to the Plato uh, letter. And he tells that he is rather proud of helping this a sort of a guru. He is, he is uh, uh, looking up to Plato as if he were a guru. After five years, Matthew, his father, 
has sent a letter to his son to come, asking him to come home. I should say that we have 17 letters, but actually there are references to much more letters received by Kion. I have counted at least 11. So it means that the correspondence is much bigger than we, uh, that we can read and very often we can read what the letter sent to Kian uh, was about because he resumes the content of it. I'm not coming now. Remember that it is not the journey to the academy that makes a man good but unwearied studies extended over a long period. And he tells, actually he tells that he will, uh, he will stay until he has been in, in, uh, the, in the academy for 10 years. Now it is five years and um, you, you can see that, that uh, the young man has decided to stay. And uh, later on in this letter, he tells us that it is important to be close to Plato. It's a strange way of, 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 of uh, uh, thinking of a, of a teacher. You have to be close to him. This theme turns up later on. But um, as a matter of fact, sometimes in the works of Plato, we hear people uh, saying a thing very similar to that. For example, in uh, the little dialogue called Theages, there is a person who tells us that he is a very, very good per person. He is Kalos, Kakatos, when he is together with Plato, uh, with uh, Socrates. But when he is away from Socrates, he goes back to the uh, old bad habits. So this, this, uh, you could call it an osmosis theory that the people that are in the near Socrates or near Plato are a sort of, of uh, absorbers of the goodness of Plato. Um, Socrates makes jokes of this uh, in the symposium where Agathon uh, asked if he could uh, uh, lay uh, between, uh, uh, beside Socrates and he says it is not like a wick in a lamp and the oil running from one lamp to another through the wick. So uh, wisdom doesn't act in that way. But Kion has exactly the same way of thinking. If you are close to your teacher you will be absorbing the goodness from him. The goodness, it is of course arete, virtue, uh, that is uh, the key word. Um, this point in letter 12 is what we could call it, uh, the turning point of the story. Because now all his plans from, for his future for the next time, uh, for the next, uh, next time, the next five years, are uh, altered. I can't stand being better off in respect of my security than my fellow citizens. I definitely wish to be present when able men are needed. I read this quite intrepidly since Lysis carries the letter to you. You remember Lysis? who was the person in the first letter. And this, this person was, must be a person that he trusts in. Um, who he is, we don't know, but he must be traveling from Athens to Heraclea uh, and back. And uh, he is taking letters with, with him. And this, uh, this time he can write quite openly and honestly to his father, I am planning. Uh, to kill the time. Um, now he is on his way back. He is in uh, Byzantium. I should uh, have mentioned that, that he has to wait half a year because of the winter. You can't sail in these 
uh, seas uh, in the winter, it's too risky, too stormy, and uh, you have to wait until spring. So now we are in spring, and uh, Kian explains to his father his reasons for killing Kliakos. And this is interesting. By the success of this Kliakos, some will be inspired to become tyrants. Others will become accustomed to subjection. And finally, affairs will develop into perpetual despotism. This sounds quite a bit like Plato or even more of Aristotle. I will return to Aristotle in a moment. Then, Kian writes a letter, a long letter, full of lies in order to prevent the tyrant suspicions playing, he is playing the contemplative, unworldly philosopher. As a matter of fact, when he was in Athens, he was attacked by one of uh, Cleocos's men. It was actually in uh, Pericles' Udaion, just 200 meters from here, where he was attacked. But since he was a very skilled young man, uh, he, uh, he could knock down uh, this aggressor and uh, had him arrested and uh, given over to the authorities. But he knows that Cleocos is suspicious and therefore he has to write a letter to calm him down. And um, he plays a sort of philosophical nerd not uh, very interested in uh, things outside the philosophical circles. And he uh, ends his letter saying, let the arts of war and peace be reserved for you and set apart from me just so much of your tyranny as seems to, uh, uh, seems to fit to allow a man of inactive disposition to lead a tranquil life. If you just let me alone, I shall let you alone, he says in this <coughs> letter full of lies. The last letter um, is a letter to Plato, a farewell letter, where he explains all the things he is going to do. Two days before the Dionysia, I shall send my most faithful servants to you, Pylades and Philokalos. It is interesting that Pylades, you remember, he was the companion of Orestes uh, when, when uh, killing uh, the royal family uh, after the killing of Agamemnon. So Pylades means a very trustworthy, uh, and never deceiving uh, companion. And these persons are freely invented. There are lots of freely invented persons with funny names taken from history or mythology. Here are two of them. For at the uh, Dionysia, I intend to make an attempt upon the tyrant's life. I know I shall be killed, and my only prayer is that I shall not suffer death until I have done away with the tyrant. So um, this is, uh, this is uh, part of it, 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 uh, it continues here. In a dream I saw a woman of marvelous beauty. She showed me a very beautiful tomb and said, now when your work is done, Kian, go and find rest in this tomb. It's interesting because it's only the, uh, the, the second time the word Kian is mentioned in the text. And here we have uh, a person in a dream seeing a woman, which may be freedom, which may be democracy, which may be all kinds of positive, uh, positive um, uh, figures, um, and she tells him, go and find rest in this tomb. What I may happen to perform will be held greater than I shall suffer, and I myself will be honored more by those to whom I have, been, I have done good if I purchase freedom for them at the price of my own death. 
You can hear it looks and sounds quite a sort of uh, martyrium. Some of the words here, uh, you know, from from uh, Christians being being killed by the, the, uh, the brutal Romans and things like that. But it is in a, a way a person who decides to 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 kill a person, knowing that he will be killed himself. But that would be. Uh, a freedom for them at the price of my own death. Here, yeah, uh, the letter stops. There are no more. And we, the readers, the ancient readers at least, know that it had had no purpose at all because the tyrant uh, was killed, but there was another tyrant taking over and uh, the uh, family, uh, family, continued <coughs> being tyrants in, uh, in the town for the next hundred years. So, uh, in a way, this killing was in vain. In a way. Because uh, tyrannic sites in Greek history are very famous and there are lots of them. I've just made, uh, mentioned two here. Uh, the most uh, famous, of course, are uh, Harmodius and Aristogeiton. But in a way, the murder of Caesar, Brutus and the others uh, murdering Caesar, are uh, examples of exactly the same. There is a pattern of tyrannicide. And uh, this pattern is uh, very clear, but, uh, actually, at the Habotius and Irish Stogaita uh, story. You know that in Herodotus there is uh, a more popular uh, way of explaining it, and Thucydides says all this is rubbish. Actually, uh, tyranny was not uh, eliminated by, uh, by the killing of Hipparchus, uh, the tyrant, there was just a brother taking over. So, in a way, um, uh, the Chian his history is a copy of the Hamaldius and Aristogeiton. But there is a very, very um, important difference. Aristotle has in his uh, Politics, uh, Book 5, Chapter 10, uh, a list of reasons why people um, start killing tyrants. Tyrannicide act out of greed, hatred, or because of sexual abuse and humiliation. Philosophical reasons are not mentioned. That means that our Kian is an exception. Uh, in, the, in the Harmodius and Aristogeiton uh, story, it was humiliation and sexual abuse. Often it is greed, uh, 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 greed, I want to be a tyrant, I kill the other guy in order to be it myself. But this is the only example I have found for a philosophical reason to be a tyrant killer. Um, Plato has in the, the Republic, uh, in the last part of uh, book 8 and in the beginning of 9, uh, a, a description of tyranny. And he says that tyranny is the worst, is, is the worst constitution, uh, even worse than democracy. The tyrannical man, meaning the future tyrant, is mentally so ill, so kakos, poniros, uh, that he cannot be cured, therefore tyrannicide is legal and necessary. And that means that, that uh, to Aristotle and to Plato, uh, tyrannicide is acceptable because of this ex extreme uh, person that uh, behaves and Plato has a description of, of this uh, tyrant who is like an animal. 
he, is, uh, he, he explains it uh, with the myth of Lucan, uh, the person, uh, the, the king of, of uh, Arcadia, uh, who became a wolf. He was a wolf inside and became a real wolf after being so t terrible, cruel. Uh, there was cannibalism and all sorts of things that, like that, uh, like real times. Um, then it turned out that tyrannicide was not only a subject in history, but also in rhetoric schools. And that means that uh, if you read Cicero, Seneca the Elder, Tacitus, Lucian, and probably lots of, uh, more, uh, I've just working, been working with these four, you find that the theme tyrannicide is very, very popular. Tacitus has a very morbid description. He says that uh, there are more tyrannicides in, uh, in the school exercises that, than there are in courts all over the world. They don't exist in reality, but we use them as, as scapegoats or as examples. Seneca, Seneca the Elder has written a very interesting set of texts called controversiae, meaning um, conflicts uh, should, that should, could be debated uh, by students of uh, rhetoric. And um, there are lots of stories about tyrants behaving uh, in incredible ways. Lucian, who is a satirist and may be making fun of this, I'm not quite sure, but he may be, he tells about a story, it is called Tyrannoctonos, and he tells a story about a man who went up to the Acropolis in order to kill, um, to kill the tyrant. Actually, the tyrant wasn't present, but the tyrant's son was, and he killed the son. Afterwards, the tyrant came, and finding uh, the dead son, took the sword that, uh, that the son has been killed with and committed suicide. Then this person uh, asks uh, a premium uh, for, uh, for killing two tyrants. And you can hear this, this is, uh, this is uh, in a way quite funny and, uh, and absurd and things like that. But it means that the idea of Tyrannicide as an extreme means of solving a political problem is not uncommon. I told you uh, that, that um, linguistics tell us that uh, this text must have been written in the first or second century AD. There is some very, very good uh, examples. For example, uh, he says uh, in one of the letters, it was about the sixth hour when something happened. You may remember from the New Testament that uh, this uh, dating or uh, enumerating of hours in the day is rather common. The sixth hour, the ninth hour and so on. The sixth hour means uh, six hours from sunrise, uh, so uh, it is uh, midday. That's why in, in uh, Spanish and Italian, uh, midday is called siesta, the sexta hora. But in classical Greek, this way of uh, numbering uh, the hours was not yet existing. So he has made a slip here and uh, using a modernism uh, that, will, uh, that will tell that this is written not in the 4th century uh, uh, BC, but in the 1st or 2nd AD. There are other uh, uh, things of that, and uh, in, the, in the edition of Ingemar Düring, that I told about before, you can see lots of more uh, examples. There are some more experiments of these Briefroman, uh, genre. Uh, there is a, se a selection of uh, letters from Hippocrates 
and there is uh, uh, some letters from Themistocles, but they are not uh, combined in a way that is so uh, concrete that, like, uh, as this is. And then I have talked about the rhetorical tradition, um, uh, the controversy, and then we have to ask the question, is Kion a Platonist? And that means we have to ask, what is a Platonist in the first century AD? He is not a German scholar of the 19th century. And we who have been taught reading Plato in the Schleiermacher tradition, uh, we, uh, we have very great difficulties with understanding how Plato and Platonism looked what it looked like uh, in uh, the first century uh, AD. There is, uh, this is a, the period what we normally call Middle Platonism, which was a mixture of several, uh, several streams coming from uh, Stoicism, uh, from uh, the academics, from old-fashioned Platonism, and so on. So it is a, mi a mixture. And in this mixture, the idea of the philosophical killing of a, uh, of a tyrant may have turned up. And um, actually, we don't exactly know what the person who wrote it meant. Did he agree with uh, Kion or didn't he? Um, this is uh, Heracles again. What is Heracles doing? Yes, he is killing uh, not a tyrant, but a monster. Tyrants are monsters in a way. And um, perhaps it's just a story of, uh, from Greek mythology. Perhaps it is symbolism. Perhaps it is a comment on uh, the artist's struggles with uh, critics, other, uh, other um, artists and so on. And if you look very, very close to his eye, to his uh, head, you will see that this uh, Hercules has uh, a face which is rather like Tina's own. It's not so. Uh, I, I couldn't. I couldn't uh, find a, a close-up picture. But um, if you see him, you can see uh, see uh, he has made uh, portraits of himself and with lots of, of photos and so on. I'm quite sure that this is Rudolf Tyner himself fighting uh, the Danish critics uh, and and. Uh, uh, people who wouldn't, wouldn't give him uh, money to be creative and things like that. That means uh, most people that, uh, that uh, sail into the harbour of Elsinore will see this person. Some uh, funny guys say it's uh, our fight with Sweden. Uh, it is not. I, I'm pretty sure it isn't. But um, in a way, this uh, double meaning uh, has uh, some similarities to what we see in, uh, in the Kian novel. Perhaps, perhaps uh, the author thinks that Kian was right in doing that. Perhaps he is exposing a young, uh, a young rather naive person Perhaps he is just making an exercise. I don't know. I don't know yet. I don't know if I would ever uh, be, be, uh, be sure of it. But uh, it is an interesting text. And um, as I said in the beginning, I plan to make a translation with a commentary on it. But um, in... Um, in, in the, the Tainer situation, we have letters, we have photos, we have other texts and so on. But in the case of Kian, we have only the letters, or rather, a novel of letters.
This is a sort of a key novel, uh, to, um, uh, and it was written in in Rome uh, in order to exhort people to, uh, to to find against Domitian, the the terrible uh, tyrant uh, uh, emperor Domitian. And I'm not so sure, because you can see, for example, a very interesting letter. Uh, written by Cicero in uh, 49 BC when uh, the fight between uh, Pompeius and Caesar is coming up. Uh, he says, I'm so worried, I don't know what to do. I have to write a letter to you, Atticus, and um, when I'm not writing or reading your letters, I am so anxious that I have to do something. And then he tells that he in Greek, that's rather funny, but in Greek he writes 
and um, and things of themes that are so close to what we're talking about here, uh, Shivani side. And you can see that this letter, in a way, forms a model for what will happen in um, uh, with uh, with uh, Caesar in 44 when he is killed. And uh, Plutarch's description uh, of of uh, Brutus, he has a, a description of Plutus, uh, of uh, Brutus, and uh, Suetonius's de description of the murder of Caesar uh, have so many similarities that I think we should be very, very careful to place this on one historical fact. Uh, and Dürer might be right, but he might be wrong. Uh, I'm not sure that we should uh, think of this text as an uh, uh, exhortation to violence. And I, 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 for the time being, I don't think. Uh, I think it is a philosophical um, way of, of formulating uh, a very difficult problem. And uh, when we see our, in our own times, we have lots of examples of exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Are you allowed to kill a prominent officer in, uh, in, uh, uh, in a foreign country like it was done two months ago? Uh, or uh, is it, is it uh, like, like uh, Plato says, uh, tyrants are so deprivated and so um, uh, uh, disturbed in their mind, then they can't be cured. Are we allowed to, uh, to kill people out of these, uh, these uh, reasons, or are we not? So I d I'm not sure that, that we have to, to, to fix it and, uh, at, at a specific point. But, uh, I have to say that, uh, that the last edition of this, which is not very good, uh, has uh, suggested that it was written in Constantinopolis in the 4th century AD. Uh, I, don't, I don't think, and most, most uh, philologists don't think it's right, but uh, it, it only shows how difficult it is to pinpoint uh, the, the, the historical fact. But maybe, um, expanding on it, maybe it doesn't necessarily need to be a specific point. No. I mean, the, the fact that it's in the first century when the Roman Empire well, changes a lot, and there are continuous changes to the status of the emperor and the power relationship would be. This Seneca is not the famous Seneca, it is the father of Seneca. Uh, the uh, Seneca of the Stoic the Elder. Yeah, Seneca the Elder, yeah. yes. And, and, and uh, uh, yes, and, and uh, since uh, he. He would have been so. He would have probably been acting on Tiberius later on, Tiberius. Yes, yes. So actually, when there is a. Caesar mm. was still remembered, yeah. and, and yeah. there were lots of people who thought that this was mm. the right way. And mm. as you may know, they they uh, they talked about these uh, Brutus and the others that they were the the, the, the mm. So so uh, uh, it is a word that you can use at all times when you have. An aggressor that you mm. want yeah. to get off. Yeah. Oh yes, um, it, it was quite this quotation of Aristotle. Yeah. 
greed, hatred, sexual abuse, and humiliation. Humiliation. Yeah. Those don't seem to be very good reasons to kill someone. No, but well, that, uh, maybe you could argue that they actually are. But so philosophical murders, yeah. they don't exist. Um, to Aristotle, um, they, they don't. But he has he has made it. It's a very interesting chapter, chapter ten of the book five. He is a, a, a list of lots of of of, uh, the, of uh, the killings, mm. and uh, and uh, these killings uh, are uh, are numbered and and uh, specified. Mm. And uh, I just remarked that there was no philosophical reason for this. It was uh, Aristotle is. Sometimes it yeah, is the trouble. Sorry, but when, when, so it would be because justice would be. But I suppose you could argue that the, yes. those reasons mentioned are per, the, the, the yes. to do with personal justice. Yes. But it doesn't have to do with justice in a philosophical sense. No. And uh, as he explains, it is a person murdering uh, tyrants is mainly murdering the tyrant, tyrant in order to be tyrant himself. Um, you will be astonished to see how many uh, tyrannicides he, he mentions. It's all over the Greek area, in, uh, in the Black Sea, in, uh, in Sicily, and in, in so on. So it has been a very, very violent period, and you always kill somebody out of, uh, when, when you can argue that it was, uh, it was just to do mm. it. This is just, uh, this is just, and I, I am my full right to do it. Mm. But uh, he says mainly it's greed and, and all the others. Mm. For example, Hamodius and Aristotle, it was not justice and <coughs> um, anti, anti uh, tyranny. It was because uh, one of uh, these guys' uh, sister well, had been humiliated. Mm. Yes. Please. One last one question for you. Interesting talk. And did uh, modern philosophers or writers refer to this novel? Is it mentioned, let's say, in modern texts or discussed? As far as I know, no. Uh, actually, uh, I, can, I can tell you that the reason why I started this was I was in a second-hand bookshop in Copenhagen and found a book uh, with a title I didn't know. Then I opened it and saw that it was Ingmar Düring, uh, whom I had read quite a lot of because he is uh, a very good a philosopher, he has written on Aristotle, and then he had been owned by uh, a professor of classical philology in Copenhagen, and I thought, I buy it, I don't know what it is in it. And, and um, then it has been on my shelves for some years without my reading, but, but uh, then it turned out that it was a very interesting thing. And uh, as far as I know, there is no Greek translation into modern Greek. Uh, there are to, uh, to French and, uh, and uh, doings to English, but, but it is not very commonly uh, read. And I don't know uh, if, if modern philosophers, I've never met a modern philosopher who, who knew anything about this. But they ought to. Um,